Hello. Hello. I mean, he can hear it. He can hear. And then he and I actually met as postdocs at the University of Michigan, he did. where he pioneered uh, work on intensive longitudinal methods. And at that time, there wasn't even a name for that method. Um, years later, in 2013, he wrote a seminal book with that, coining that term. Um, he has made, over the course of his career, some tremendous contributions to developing quantitative methods to study change and variability across time, as it, as Niall refers to it. Um, <laughs> oh, great song. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Anita. <clears throat> That's <clears throat> it's going to be a hard act to follow, but I'm going to try. Um, so this is possibly the m most unusual talk I've ever developed, um, because it's not really something that I've studied over my career, and but it's an issue that that uh, came up when I was asked. Oh God, let me about. 12 years ago to give a workshop on how to analyze experimental data using multi-level models. And so I, I took it seriously. I asked Tori Higgins, you know, have you got any repeated measures data sets that I can take a look at? And, and then I started to analyze them and I noticed patterns that I'm going to show you today. And then I just sort of lost the run of myself and I made this big claim which, you know, we'll see what you think about it. But it came out in this paper um, last year, last May, and it's a collaboration with two superb graduate students, um, Catherine Z and Maya Rosignac Milong, and then a good friend uh, from Israel, Ron Hussein. So you're going to see some data sets from him uh, as well. So I'm going to frame this in a kind of historical way. And by the way, I'm, I'll have to see how the time goes. I, can, I have a lot of data, but I'll, I'll modify depending on how we're doing for time. But um, can you let me know when I'm three quarters of an hour? Yeah, you're, you're strict on that? Not so much. All right, but OK. <laughs> okay. But I, I will need some reining in. I will need some reining in, probably. OK. So there's a story here, and I'm going to start a long, long time ago. And it starts with the notion of measurement error, which is 
something I didn't fully realize is at the birth of modern statistics, the idea of measurement error and how to think about it and how to, um, how to deal with it empirically. So where did this all begin? Well, it began back in the 16th and 17th century. You know, the, the various empires at that time um, were very keen on expanding. So they, they, to do that, they needed to get to these far-flung territories to, you know, do what empires do. And um, to do that, they needed to be able to navigate the seas. And the problem is that it was very, very hard to know where you were once you were in open water away from land. So, so before um, accurate star charts were developed, ships just kept the land in view and they made their way you know, down, down uh, you know, south by just always keeping an eye on the shore. So these methods, um, uh, these star charts enabled um, seafaring to change radically and be much more efficient. And, um, and how did that develop? Well, <clears throat> so you needed, you needed an accurate description of, you know, of stars and, and celestial bodies more generally to enable ships to sail in the open seas. But there was a problem that arose when people, um, when scientists and, um, um, and others tried to develop these star charts, is that when you took a measurement of a star or planet at one point in time and you took another measurement, you got a different result. And it wasn't just like measuring um, you know, length, because this involved the visual system. It involved, you know, depending on you know, impurities in the air, clouds, whatever. So there was always a problem of what to do with the variation in these measurements. And you might think, well, isn't it obvious? You just add them and divide by the number of measurements, and then you use that. Well, that was not actually thought to be OK. Um, this famous Swiss mathematician Euler said, you know, we can't do that because, because each one is error prone, so the combination of them will be even more error prone. So there was amazing to think today that this idea of taking averages was, was controversial. But people were doing it anyway, and and it led to this idea that these measurements come from a probability distribution. And it's leading to something called an error curve. And there were various people who postulated this. There's Galileo. He said, well, you know, these measurement errors, you know, they had to be symmetric. And, you know, small ones were more likely and big ones were less likely. Here's a guy, Simpson. I don't know who he is, but that's his... Um, he was some mathematician in England. That's the shape he gave to this thing. Laplace um, had this particular curve. I think there's a name for it, but it's, it's his error curve. But then this is the one that really um, took off. This is Gauss. This is the Gaussian distribution. And part of the reason that this distribution caught on is that the mean of something of this shape the average value, the central tendency, is the mean. And there is another parameter, the standard deviation. It wasn't, <clears throat> wasn't known as, as that at the time. But this was the distribution that made what people were doing already um, OK from a sort of theoretical point of view. And people quickly started using it and using it to justify um, uh, what, what they were doing, which was just getting multiple measurements and average, averaging them and with the idea that, you know, you're going to get at some truth. So then these deviations are errors. You know, they're this, it, it, it means to wander initially, but it is a sort of like, you know, who wants to commit errors? So it's an error curve, and the middle is what you want. That's, that's what you're after. And the more measurements that you average over, the more you're likely to get this true value, which is, and the rest we would like to discard because, after all, they're errors. 
<clears throat> so he developed the normal distribution. He showed that measurement errors were fit well by this distribution. Here's an interesting chapter by a, um, a historian and statistician, Stephen Stigler. He pointed out that apart from astronomy, the first field to adopt the error curve was psychology. And I hadn't really known this. So, so the, you know, many other fields eventually adopted it um, as, a, as a way of dealing with the fact that measurements you know, would vary from one time to the next. And from one person to the next, that's a whole other story because people were, were systematically different in the, in the errors that they made, but they still clustered around some average. So he, he points out that in elements of psychophysics, which was what? Um, I'm forgetting what date this is, but it's around 1860. Um, it was used immediately to describe measurements of, of um, you know, perceptual processes, and, and it, it remained in psychology ever since. And many other fields, like, let's say, economics, took way longer to recognize its usefulness. Okay, so here's where the argument I'm going to make really begins. This idea of a curve of errors was adopted by people ar around uh, sometime in the early 19th century. Lots of, we would call them, they would call them large data sets became available on measures on populations. So the famous one um, that this man, Adolphe Quetelet, used was measurements of the chest circumference of Scottish recruits. And why do they need to um, do this? Why, why would they care? And I think you know, a moment's thought would lead you to realize that you want to make you know, proper uniforms for these guys because they, you don't want to be shooting your own people out in the battlefield. So you do need uniforms. And to make uniforms, you need to know what the typical sizes are. Now, I think this guy looks very dashing. It looks like he's got gel in his hair and everything. But this is a Belgian astronomer, Adolphe Quetelet. This is him when he was, when he was young. Um, he noticed that measures of, of population characteristics or measures of all kinds of what might be called anthropometric um, things like height, weight, um, all had this curve. But what he was really taken by was a sort of error curve thinking. He talked about there being this best representation of any population, what he called the average man. And he was dead serious about this. So that the sort of the, the, the most the best, well, he used the word best representation was this middle. And then these people at, you know, toward the edges were, you know, kind of errors of a sort. So he wrote this book, A Treatise on Man, in uh, French. He was a French speaking Belgian. And this was 1835. And here's a quote. If any individual possessed all the qualities of the average man, he would represent all that is great, good, and beautiful. So you can see he's really, this average is, it's, it's, it's think, it's error curve thinking. And, you know, we might also call it, it's just reification of this, this uh, somehow, this ideal person. And that nature is striving to that, but is making you know, errors. And so the variation on either side is, is um, well, it's not great, good, or beautiful. OK. <clears throat> this is not like any talk I've ever given before, because I usually get to data pretty quickly, and we're, not, we're nowhere near the data yet. <laughs> so that's just telling you. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to get the, yes, okay, yeah. Well, I'll stop when I need to stop. Okay. 
yes, there's a yes. I mean, <clears throat> plus or minus, whatever. <laughs> but here's here's Darwin entering the picture, and his thinking about population variation was really different, so different, because you. I mean, I'm not sure he used these terms, but he certainly didn't think of variability as error. He thought of it as the foundation of natural selection. Without this variability, populations couldn't change. And so processes of um, heterogeneous populations uh, on many dimensions, but you know, we, we often think of it as genetic variation, but there's other ways to think about it. Um, but there's phenotypes in populations that look really, really different. And as environmental conditions change, or as there's competition or whatever, certain characteristics are favored. So not error, but, but crucial um, in, in biological processes. So here's if Galton, if it, so we think of, of, um, of the Gaussian curve, well, you know, this is an idealization of what we would call the bivariate normal. So you take two, so if one measurement of a measurement of one characteristic has a normal distribution, you measure two on the same population and you tend to see this um, bivariate normal, which has all these different shapes. You know, it can be just a cloud, but it can end up being more cigar-like. But the idea is that we have variation in populations, and we have it in a bivariate and a multivariate sense. So this idea of variation and covariation as essential in biological and you could say social processes was called um, by Ernst Mayer, who's a philosopher of biology, as population thinking. And the idea is that once you get up to biology and above, no two units are the same. I mean, no two cells are the same, no two um, organs are the same, and obviously no two people, no two groups. And this is just fundamental. This is just part of what it means to be a biological and social entity. But population thinking is not necessarily what all sciences engage in. So if you think about what sciences should be thinking of their subject matter as heterogeneous organisms, well, you could argue life sciences, psychology, economics, sociology, now, when we get to the special case of experimental psychology, is it a population science? Is, are the way that people who do experiments, are they thinking of, their, of, the, of the subject matter as representing heterogeneous experimental units? Okay, well, this kind of, this, this thinking of variation as involving probability distributions and variation as being important to study and characterize. You know, there are journals developed to do this, um, Biometrica. We have R.A. Fisher, who certainly recognized this. Um, he wrote these two famous books, his 1925 book, and then the one that really has had a huge impact on psychology, the design of experiments. Well, both of them did. Okay, so what is it that Fisher did to deal with this heterogeneity? And what is it that we have taken from Fisher? Well, he certainly was very, very interested in heterogeneity of all sorts. Um, but I want us to focus on his experimental designs. So unfortunately, I've got a lot of text here. So he definitely recognizes that there's heterogeneity in experimental units. But if I think of the tradition that we have adopted in experimental psychology, which is kind of a repeated measures kind of tradition, we can think of what he, his thinking is that 
we allow for heterogeneity, but we make our comparisons within as homogeneous a unit as possible. So you could call that blocking and experimental design. But he invented repeated measures ANOVA. That was the first ANOVA he talks about in his 1925 book. And that is, so people are different, the units you're studying are different, but what if you make the experiments about those people in different, in different um, conditions? So he had, he recognized that there were three sources of variability. And I'm, I will get, I mean, we, we can talk about these. There's the treatment conditions. So you want them to be as uniform as possible so that the differences can be um, interpreted properly. So you want those to be held, you want those to be uniform. The experimental units are going to be different. And then there's measurement error, which is always present um, in when you get to biological and social measures. He never mentioned causal heterogeneity, um, but he allowed for it. So if you, anytime you do repeated measures ANOVA, you allow for heterogeneity of responses to treatments, if, you're, if that's the kind of data you have. But it's hidden from you. And if you look at texts on experimental design and, and statistical analysis, some of them will say that you can, uh, you can estimate the size of the heterogeneity by doing various calculations on the results of repeated measures ANOVA. But in general, it's not recognized. Because what's happened is you, you are now comparing people to themselves in different conditions. And the idea that they might be different in their responses kind of has been left um, unaddressed a lot. This, is, this next point is just one that you know, helped me sort of recognize this idea. And it's, it's something you may, some of you may not have any, have never heard of this. It's Don Rubin's idea of causation, which is fundamentally a within unit comparison. So it fits with what we've been talking about. A causal effect, this delta I, is going to be an individual's, or whatever the unit is, their response in one condition minus their response in another condition. But in his framework, it, they have to be, in a sense, ident happening at the same time, which is not possible. So it's, so it's like nothing else can be, it, it's count, man, this fancy word, it's counterfactual. He, he doesn't believe you can, you can estimate this, but he starts with the assumption that effects are heterogeneous. Because everybody, so I represents person here, so every, you know, I equals one has their own delta, two, three, everybody's different. His main point is that when you do a standard experiment, you do get the average causal effect. So you you know, there is this heterogeneity, but you can get at what happens to the typical person. And this, again, to me, represents this problem that, you know, what about the heterogeneity? What about the differences between people? So in between group experiments, you get this average causal effect. But I want to argue that in repeated measures designs of the sort that are often done in cognitive and social cognition and other areas of psychology, you can, in a sense, get individual causal effects or something you can argue as individual causal effects. So why? Well, there's a lot of assumptions you have to make, as always, with statistical ideas and ideas of cause. You have to believe that the stimuli within each condition, so you need multiple trials, so we're now we have to think about this in a repeated measures kind of context, but you need to think of stimuli as being interchangeable within conditions. I'll, I'll get to details in, I mean, I, we'll get to data very soon now. That these stimuli, I mean, they ideally we want to assume that, that they don't 
that people don't respond differently to the stimuli. They can respond differently to the conditions, but we, but we, we generally can't estimate this interaction if it's there. Order effects are negligible and carryover effects are negligible. Okay, <laughs> finally, where, where am I, where am I, where am I on time? Okay, I can do it. Okay, so here's a data, here's the data set that I got from Tori Higgins. This, this is Abby Scholler, who's uh, um, a faculty member at um, um, Waterloo now. Here is a really simple experiment where we're looking at reaction time, and we're taking the log here, but the question that she was interested in is if we show people positive and negative adjectives, and they get them one by one, and they have to decide whether these describe them or not. And so they say does or doesn't. So then we have this valence. So we have a whole bunch of negative and a whole bunch of positive stimuli. And here's some data, insecure, thrifty, clumsy, enthusiastic, orderly, stubborn, worrying, cynical. And no big surprise, people are faster. So one is the positive, minus one is the negative. They're faster when to say that positive traits describe them. Okay, that's all I came to show you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Hopefully, yeah, okay, but, but not really. But if you did do this, and you did a repeated measures ANOVA, you'd say participants were slower to respond to negative compared to positive self-relevant traits. The mean difference was this many log RT units, and here's a confidence interval. Whoops, and there's the test. And then in milliseconds, this is around 200 milliseconds faster for positive. That's the write-up. Well, there's more you can do with these data than use repeated measures ANOVA. So I'm going to just show you, and this may be old hat to some of you, but multi-level or mixed effects regression models allow you to do more. They give the same results as repeated measures ANOVA if the data are all, you know, there's no missing data and things like that. So these are what they call. They give the same results, but they make it feasible to examine heterogeneity. So here is the raw data for each participant. It's a small data set. And I'm going to quickly move on to show you. So you can see that, well, there's, there's an unbalance, like a balance here, so people are more likely to choose positive, but they're faster in most cases. So in these models, fixed effects are the average. So this is going to be this average man, average woman. But the random effect is the, so that's the mean. This is going to be a standard deviation, how much people differ. I won't go into, but you can do this in SPSS, you can do it in R, you can do it in any major software. So we find the exact same average effect, but now we have evidence that people differ. So there's the mean in log RT units, but here's the standard deviation, 0.22. That matters for how we talk about the phenomenon. And here is the fit, so these are not, these are what the model predicts for individuals. And you can see a range of values going from strongly negative to some positive, or a little bit positive. And then here's another way of showing, yes, there's an average, but look at this, there are, there's quite a bit of variation around this. And this is not measurement error. And in fact, measurement error is, is sort of removed from this. But, it's, but the interpretation I make of this is this is real variability. It doesn't make the mean be unimportant, but it's there. Here is if we assume that this variation is normally distributed, which is what these models often do, and it's often not a really bad idea when you look at the actual data, we get 81% show uh, are faster for positive, but the model predicts that there's actually a good number of people that are a little bit, um, that show reversals. Now if you write this up, what do you say? You say something different, and, and I think it matters. The typical person is 200 milliseconds slower to choose negative versus positive traits, but there's evidence that people in the population, now we have the sample, but we're making inference, the population differ in the size of this effect. So if we take a 95% bounds for this normally distributed variable in the population, 
Some are 60, 680 milliseconds slower, but some are up to 270 milliseconds faster. And then there's that same thing. 81% were slower, but 19% were faster. So I was pretty shook by this when I saw it. In that paper, we did this experiment again, like I did it finally um, myself, <laughs> and found similar results. Then I got, then I was talking with Ron Hassin, and he um, had some data that um, we looked at. This is also not a wonderfully exciting research question, but are you faster at recognizing faces when they're the right side up versus the upside down? Actually, he also had a sideways, but I'm just going to show you the difference between the speed of recognition for right side up which is here, and upside down. Now again, there is variability. And there's somebody here, and again, these are model predicted. Somebody here is just pretty, he's, fat, he's just as good or she's just as good. And here's again the kind of range of values. Okay, I don't want to say that everything shows this type of variability. It's really, I mean, my view on this is that we should recognize that it could be there and recognize that these are, we're, we're in the people, the animals that we're studying, they are not all the same. And it's just sort of the way that things are. I mean, this is, this is just a feature and you just, you know, you can ignore it, but if you face it, you learn something. But not everything shows this heterogeneity. So here's a pretty famous paper that Ron wrote um, that came out in PNAS. Um, so he was, he was able to show that he could subliminally prime addition. So you could do addition subliminally. So he would show you, you know, 8 plus 2 subliminally, and then how quick were you to um, say 10 or 15? And he was able to show this. This effect, it's like everybody's the same. That's, that's, and here's what it looks like if you want to look at this. So here's zero, now these, these units, so you can just see that there's, there's a real effect and people are all the same. Okay. I'm don't, I mean, I'm depending, I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot more to do. Okay, this original Abby Scholler data set, I didn't fully realize in the beginning how interesting it was, the study that they did. And, and the original study came out in Journal of uh, Experimental Social Psychology um, in 2014. She actually had the same experiment a week apart so the same task, if you like. So we can look at the stability of this heterogeneity. So I showed you the bivariate normal earlier. Well, you know, given the phenomenon, we should expect some kind of bivariate normal, but you know, is it like just this circular thing? So. If a participant showed a large difference at time one, would he or she show it at time two? Well, this really, oh, and you know, there's, there's different, you know, there's, it's not quite the same at each time point, and there were some other things involved in, but they don't matter for what we're interested in. Here is what the data, well, here, here's the predicted um, scatter plot of the random effects. And so there's a very tight relationship between these differences that are there at both time points. I'm not saying this is the way it would be in general. I do think it's interesting that in this particular case. All right, I have one more example. How much time? time. I've got one more example and I do think, I mean, I find this to be fun. Um, there's an experiment that is often viewed as the f 
first experimental investigation in social psychology. And the social psychologists in the room will all have heard of triplet, 1898. So I have used this in my research methods class. I've talked about it. And, and I realized, you know, in 1898, he was interested initially in cyclists and the speed at which they went. This is just pictures from around then. Um, um, he, he, I guess people, maybe they just didn't have a lot of data, but he presents all the data from his experiment in the paper. So the paper is in American Journal of Psychology, which just still exists, but I have a feeling it's just not as as great a journal for publishing in these days. But here's the title, the di well, well, I won't even try and read it, but here's, here it is. So he was very interested in cyclists. And I, if I had more time, I could show you, he has data showing that cyclists go faster when they are with other cyclists than when they're alone, even for similar kinds of lengths of, um, um, similar courses. So like a good experimental psychologist, he didn't think of himself as a social psychologist, of course. You could also think of this um, as the first sports psychology experiment, too. He came up with what he called a competition machine. And here's what it looked like. These are fishing reels, and there's two people only one is getting measured, but you see this? So there's a flag, and if you turn that thing really, really fast, the flag goes you know, back and forth, and the whole idea is to turn it fast enough that the flag goes as fast as possible, and you beat the other person. So it's a competition machine. I think it's a, it looks, doesn't look great, but it, it you know, I, and there's no picture of it when it actually was in operation. I mean, I'd love to get a real picture of it. Now, the thing that surprised me is that this wasn't a study of adults. He actually studied kids, school kids, and some of them quite young. The biggest surprise to me was that when he presented his results, he was emphasizing the heterogeneous responses. Now, this never got into the social psychology summaries. So I think um, Floyd Allport wrote a text in 1925. He is the person who first really mentions this study. And you'd never get the sense, now I'm going to show you all the data. He created three tables. Now, there was a whole bunch of kids. I know you can't read the names here, but there's Violet, Anna, Willie, Bessie. <laughs> Now, these are 10, 9, 11, 12. There's great names, uh, Clyde, Lucille, Bertha, you know. So these were the kids that were positively affected. There were six conditions, alone or in competition. And they, which is where I'm going with this, we actually have repeated um, trials in the different conditions. So he made three tables. These were the ones that got faster when they were with others, and they were the majority. But here's people who got slower, and these people in the middle had no effect. There's 40 kids. There's some as old as 17, but some as young as, as uh, nine. OK, so here's, he certainly didn't show the results this way, but here's what, here's what the data looked like. And these are the raw data now of the differences. And this is, I'm um, forgetting what this, this um, uh, what these units mean. But, but the average kid was faster with peers. And then here's no difference. So you can see, you can see why, you know, you might want to say, all right, they're f faster. And well, if you analyze these data the same way I've been talking about before, look what happens. You get a very, very different distribution, and it's not the one that he was emphasizing. So 
this is something that you learn when you understand multi-level models is that these estimates are you know, just based on a small number of observations. We can't necessarily trust them. So there's sampling error, or you could think of it as a form of measurement error. So these kids are more different than they really should be. And I haven't, sh you know, I haven't shown you this in the other data sets. But especially here where we've got six measurements, um, we really want to adjust for the uncertainty here. And this is what the model does. And I think it's very interesting because it removes a good bit of the heterogeneity. And in particular, it removes the kind where there was some kids were, made, were slower when they were competing with a peer. And that, I think that's very interesting. So look, the model is now saying, yes, on average, kids are faster with peers. But they're not all the same. So I'm just showing you now this. This is the predictions from the model. And you know, this is just showing you uh, the statistical phenomenon of shrinkage. Um, there were only, f there, were, there were fewer observations in this group. And, and, and this is not something that I, I, we can go into if you're interested. But these guys are being shrunken in. And they're actually, because there's fewer observations, they're actually shrink, you know, it's not a, you see they're shrinking way in. Everybody is. But we've lost these reversals. So now what's, what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is, I guess you could say that the average kid was faster. I mean, that's what, you know, this new analysis of the day. The average kid was faster when they were competing with a peer rather than when they were just doing it alone. But some kids, you know, were no faster. And some kids were like twice as fast. And that's our best guess now as to what the triplet results were. So there's a lot to bear in mind here, like, first of all, his, his view of the data, which didn't get summarized in textbooks, and then the fact that you could say the textbooks were getting it more or less right, but there's heterogeneity of the same kind that I keep talking about. All right, so conclusions, grand conclusions. So my, I would like to argue that causal effects in psychology, we were, we, that's, that's what we're after. We should not, or why should we work from the assumption of homogeneity? Why should we just do our analyses and look at our results in that way? Modern treatments of causality, so very, it's not just Rubin but others, they all start from the assumption that there is heterogeneity, whether they believe you can estimate it or not. And by analyzing Experimental data, repeated measures data using mixed models, this heterogeneity can be examined directly. And it, you know, if you read the paper, you know, we just make, you know, we talk about how it can inform theory. There's other methodological issues about how it might be better for replication if you use these models. But that's the message. And thank you very much. Is that good timing? Yeah, okay, perfect. great, right. So we have time for, uh, for questions, so any questions? Yes. Um, so Did I just turn off, hold on. I'm sorry, just, just in case you want to look back at. Uh, no, this is very interesting, thank you. I'm curious about, um, so like the, I said the more homogeneous one you showed, the big regression of that. Well, that was, that was still heterogeneous. It was actually this subliminal addition uh, right. one. Oh, yeah, that yeah, one. That one. Um, Right, it's an excellent, yeah, it's an excellent question. I would like to get this thing back. I'm not sure what happened. But I do have an answer to that. So we did struggle with that in the paper. <clears throat> if you, if 
the standard deviation um, is half the size of the mean, then if, you're, if it's a normally distributed variable, then you're going to find that that range, that standard deviation, will mean that the mean of you, that people at the sort of lower end will be essentially showing no effect, and people at the higher end will be showing twice the average effect. I mean, that's so that you definitely, and I'm, I've shown you that multiple times, but I don't think that's, I mean, you know, it's what's, what cutoff? I mean, this is the problem with cutoffs. What, what would you use? We suggested that if the standard deviation was a, qu a quarter of the mean, that it's probably worth talking about this result. Because if that's the case, then there are some people that are half, you know, if, if you go two, two standard deviations down, you've got the lower, people at the lower end are showing half the, half the size of the average effect. Thank you, I just bumped against it. And others are showing 50% more. And that, I mean, if I were talking about a phenomenon and it had that kind of variability, I think I'd want to know. But um, should I take it? Pull it out and plug I it in. Again. It does well. I I just backed into it. So, yeah. So that's so that was our rule of thumb. I mean, we have it in the paper, but I could see other ones, and and that's not based on a statistical test. That's a kind of descriptive measure. But there are there are obviously ways you could do tests because, and that's a separate issue. You know, so if it is, you know, a quarter of the fixed effect, how confident can we be that that's what it is? But I'm leaving that aside. OK. Any, any other? Yes? Um, just one quick question. Um, I just have a question. It's kind of just like one bullet point on one slide. But, um, <laughs> yeah, probably. Sorry, when you were talking about kind of the idea of assuming that, like in a condition where you have um, people looking at the same stimuli. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't, I mean, so they're crossed random effects in, you know, in the technical sense. And, I mean, it makes sense that they could interact, but you generally can't estimate it. Yeah, I guess I was, um, well, for one, just going to ask, like, were, like, in those experiments, were they treated as a cross mainly? Like yes. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, yeah, so, so, I mean, there's a whole other thing we could do here, which is we, t we treat persons and stimuli as, um, as random effect, and that's the correct way. And if you go to the voluminous online, um, you know, supplemental materials, you'll see, you'll see all those models, and you'll see them in frequentist and, and Bayesian estimation, and they, you know, they don't, they don't differ very much. But yes, so th this all is unaffected essentially when you go to, I mean, I didn't show you that complicated model, but that, but we have all those sort of, so, so the code I was showing you there for R and all the rest, it didn't have random stimuli, but, but we, but we do those models. I was trying to keep it simple. So, so you think of the persons as sampled from a population, but you think of the stimuli as also sampled. So we could have had other positive stimuli than the ones we actually used, and other negative ones. So, so ideally, in the repeated measures ANOVA, and I mean, this is not a new point. Anybody who's methodologist in the room know that this, was, this point was made by someone, Herb Clark, at Stanford a long time ago, that we should be treating the stimuli as random, and we should. And, and so there's uncertainty from that. But yes, I didn't. That is the, that's the sort of, the, you could call it the more full or proper way, and it's in the supplemental materials. There's a lot of supplemental materials. I mean, if you, anyone's really interested, you can see more than you want. Yes? I'm curious how many um, within subject conditions do you think is the minimum for this kind of analysis? Like if you just had two within subject conditions as opposed to repeating each one yeah. time. 
to do that. So that variation is unique? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you're going to have, you know, in, in estimating random effects, pe you know, are people different? Well, you're going to need, you know, you, well, you need more than, you know, one observation in one condition and one observation in another to even get off the ground at all. And that's, the, and that's what's good about, you know, the typical repeated measures design um, that you get in cognitive and social cognition because, you know, there's usually 20, 40 or more stimuli in each condition. And there may be multiple conditions. But, I mean, but if you want to sort of be precise about it, I mean, you can do a power analysis and see, and you will have far less power. So, so in the triplet data, I mean, I think it was pushing it. There were three, there were three, the kids were seen three times in the alone and three times in the competition. And so, um, now that would mean that the, uh, the estimates would be, you know, in a sense, more full of sampling error or whatever, and they shrink more. But, but the models, you know, there, we still were pretty confident that there was heterogeneity. So if I were designing experiments, I would certainly be, I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can do power analyses and see what's, you know, what power have you to detect a random effect if it's there. I guess I'm, part of the reason I'm wondering is because like we, we do a lot of studies that are, or, you know, we as a field do a lot of studies that are uh, an experiment moderated by an individual difference. Yep. Right? And so if you have, like, what you're suggesting is that the variability in effect size of the within subject manipulation is probably not going to be very reliable if I only have one measure of it. And so are those studies even viable? Now, are you, are you talking about the variable that's predicting the differences or just the... the yeah, the I'm saying that if just having two within subjects per condition, per, 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 sorry, per participant is not a lot. Well, you can't... Able to really know much about yeah. that variability, then could, like, is there even any point in trying to then predict that variability with something else based on well, having... Right, well, these models won't work unless you have more than, well, you have to have at least two because, because it's doing is it's trying to figure out how much real variability is there. Mm -hmm. And it's, to do that, it has to have an estimate of, you know, of, yeah, now I'm using the term, of <laughs> error within the repeated measures condition. And you need at least two, yeah. but I mean, I would think that's not going to work uh, for many kinds of uh, situations. So, yeah, the more the merrier, as as always. But it's but the, but I was I didn't know what was going to happen. I just had this idea. Let's just take a look at the triplet data. I mean, it's all there. I mean, Bessie and you know those guys, those people are all dead now. And I think would they would they would they in modern human subjects, uh, you know, would they allow their names to be immortalized? Well, they are. Uh, um, yeah, Liz. Well, so I had pretty much the same question as Kristen, but just to like probe it a little further, I guess, because I love this idea, and I've been thinking about how, although I usually do between subject stuff, like it'd be great to do more repeated measures within subjects, but just like going beyond doing things on a computer screen with like yes, yes, of course. Milliseconds, yeah, it is so hard to think of like a bunch how of would you that possibly do this. <laughs> well, well, I mean, the yeah. triplet is it's sort of a, well, so a three, no idea. So but yeah, even that's hard, right? Even like that's hard. But like, then I start to think about it of like, if it's equivalent to when I think about power in just a between subject study, we now know what we used to do when I was in grad school of like 15 per condition. We now know is like embarrassingly nowhere near enough, mm -hmm. right? That's true. And so is that I also, that. seems like it may also, I don't have the intuition for it, but it seems like that might also be the case. Like 15 observations between condition is also embarrassingly nowhere near enough. In which case I'm like, this is a cool curiosity. It's never gonna have any meaning for me. Um. Well, well, you have, I mean, when you're comparing people to themselves, all those differences between people don't come into play. Um, so, 
just in terms of your getting an average effect, you have a lot more power. You know, uh, you know, and you. Yeah, you, you the numbers should be a lot. A lot yeah, more but more. but you but but to show that there is difference in responses, that's a different power question, and so you do need. I mean, I can't say how much you need. I'm surprised that six repeated measures worked, but and the thing that struck me when I saw these results across multiple data sets is that there are so many data sets already in existence that you could look at, and you, could, and you wouldn't be finding a different average result, you just would be finding, so I'm, I'm saying, Liz, maybe you don't have to collect more of your own data, but there's other people's data that might inform. That, so to you graduate students and postdocs, just think about all the data sets that already are there. I mean, you, it would not be, I'm, I believe it wouldn't be that difficult to just use the code that we have or just any multi-level code and just see because it, I think it does matter. Um, it, I think it matters. If you read the paper, you'll see the kind of way in which we think your statements would differ. Um, I think there was somebody back here. I'll just, I don't, you again, yes. I'm just, so I'm, maybe I'm just um, misunderstanding everything, but I'm, I'm sort of stuck on, like I think the idea that causal effects are heterogeneous is or heterogeneous Either one. <laughs> um, is, it, like, I mean, to me, that doesn't. That seems like that's something that we study all the time. Like even in a between subjects design, if we have a manipulation, again, it's moderated by an individual difference, right? So if you yes, about yes, you can you can see, see evidence. Yeah. And so I'm I'm trying to think about like how to put these things together, and is and and yeah, just like. Is what you're saying that doing this in a between subjects way, where let's say I, you know, I give you a relationship thread and you yeah, have a relationship yeah. thread, and, you and then we, and yeah, then we model by like a yeah, style sure. or something like that. Like, is that just completely crazy? No, I mean that's, but that it's is so much. It's so much more crude <coughs> than what you're suggesting. And so well, kind of well, I don't think I, I, I don't think I wouldn't say that myself because I think you, it's really you think of, in a between subjects experiment, the heterogeneity is there, you just can't see it, you know. But you know it's there, or you assume that it's there, if I say, right, like attachment security makes the relationship thread yeah, that yeah. you draw public, I'm like, that whole statement is one about heterogeneity. Yeah, it is, it is, and, and <laughs> yeah, heterogeneous sounds a little bit like erogenous, so I try and avoid it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, I don't want to bring sex into it, you know. Yeah, right, that's just me. Um, Call them erogenous effects. Yeah, well that would get more press, I think, um, oh, I have to say, because I haven't seen the newspapers picking up on this <laughs> at all. And I, now, now, I, now, that, now that you mention, I think I can see yeah, a way forward to get on, uh, you know, US News and World Report, okay. Um, sorry, but, the, but I'm, I'll just make one point about this. Between subjects designs, have, this is part of what you see. You can't see it, but it's there. You can pick up on it if, you know, by theory you can have measures and you can, you can, sh you can show that effects depend on these measures or depend on a, a manipulation of another variable. Um, the advantage of these repeated measures designs is that you can document this. You, we may not know for a hundred years what the sources of the heterogeneity are. You know, we may, maybe we just need new theory, we need new measures, but you can show that the heterogeneity is there and it's of a certain size. And that is progress, I think. So that's the advantage. You can, you can just say that this, ex this experimental phenomenon, and you saw that it replicated a week later, is fundamentally heterogeneous. We don't know why, but we're not going to say, we're not going to do the Ketelet thing and talk about the average person. In fact, we don't even talk about the average, you know, he at least talked about an average person. You just talk about the one true effect in your experiment, that in, in repeated, I mean, that, that's the sort of language. Um, by the way, we, we 
went through six months of Journal of Experimental Psychology General, JEP General, not one paper with repeated measures designs talked about the range of effects. Now, some of them just did repeated measures and over, but even when they did multi-level or mixed effects models, they might have estimated it. They never talked about it. So I think that was why we got that paper into JPG, because the editor was taken aback. And um, anyway, but if we called it heterogeneity, heter er erogeneity, I think we would have we would have had an easier time. Yeah. Probably. That might just be my lack of oh. understanding. But I, oh. L let's, let me just take someone. I, there's a guy at the back, and I, I just, I don't want to, you know, the people on the couches are. Yeah, I got a lot of couches to back here. Yeah. Village, You're talking about, like, using repeated measures design to actually be able to measure the heterogeneity, but I'm wondering if using a repeated measures design can actually introduce heterogeneity. So to give an example, like, yeah. the repeated measures design, like, it, it can give participants their computer across conditions. So sure. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I, I mean, I think you really do have to consider um, the exact research question. So I think in social psychology, you, you know, a lot of times you would choose a between subjects design because you can't let people know the two, you know, because if they know the two conditions or three conditions, they'll, they'll, they'll change their behavior. So I, I agree that it is, um, that, that that is something you, need to take into account. Um, and the one data set, just to maybe just to augment your point, the one data set that didn't show heterogeneity was this subliminal priming data set that I showed you. Um, the, so why, why is that? Why is that the one? So I don't, I don't know, but it's a good, it, is a, it is a good point. Liz, you wanted to come in. You had another question. Anyone else at the back? Yes, someone. I think you mentioned one of your assumptions is that um, that there are odor effects. Yes. I'm curious, do you ever model that to confirm whether that's the case? Like, so did you do that with sugar? So you might imagine after people experience those conditions, yes. maybe that there's a bigger effect there, but then after yeah. they, you know, they go back and forth a couple times. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, it, right. So he, the, the design, if you read his paper, you know, he did have different combinations of conditions. There were, there were different, slightly different orders. Um, and that didn't, <clears throat> when some, somebody has analyzed these data um, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, they were looking for something like this and they didn't, they didn't find it, but I have not looked specifically at order effects. It just seemed like, you know, they thought he, he had more tests in mind than just what, what we did. Um, so but, I guess, but would you recommend formally testing those assumptions in some way? Yeah, I mean, well, the whole idea of different orders is because you worry about order effects and then you want to average over them. With triplet, I you know, I, all, all I know is that he had some idea, you know, he had some comparisons he wanted to make and it didn't seem to matter. But I, I'm really, you know, this is actually not, I, I've only known these results for about six months. So I haven't, I mean, there's more that I should do on that, certainly. You had a question? Yeah, thanks for the talk. Sure. My question is about uh, one of the criticisms of the argument that Yeah, well, well, right, so we make that point because 
what this impl yes. So the implications of this is that if you don't model it, you're going to have replication failures because, I mean, I haven't gone into this issue, but if you treat everybody as if they're the same, you suddenly get way more statistical power, but it's illusory. So your effects look much stronger because the standard errors around whatever, you know, it's not that the estimate of the effect changes, but the uncertainty goes way down because you're, you're, you're acting as if everybody is the same and they're not. So modeling heterogeneity makes the power, well, it, it, you know, it lowers your power, but it's correct because if you don't do it, then you'll have this effect and you'll have a standard error and you'll think that if I just pick another sample, I'll replicate it. But if they're showing their own heterogeneity, <laughs> they're going to be further away from it. So, um, so, so f replication failures will happen if you don't take this into account. But I want to quickly say that repeated measures ANOVA does take this into account. It's just hidden. So I don't want to make it seem like, like there's, there's a, this flaw has, is, you know, has undermined all of experimental work on using repeated measures designs. It's just, oddly enough, when people are using these fancier models, sometimes they will, fit, they will simplify the model to allow everybody to be the same. And that's where the problem comes in. So, yeah, this means if, if people are more different from one another and you want to characterize it accurately, you, you know, it's going to be very hard with a small sample. But I've been showing you pretty small samples, though. You know, there were only 40 people in the triplet study. There was only 21 in the original Scholler study. So when you've got lots of repeated measurements, you can, um, you know, you can, you can identify this. But in general, it makes, yeah, there'll be replication failures to the extent that you don't take it into account. I know, uh, yes? Yes. Could you think about cases where that's not the case, and how would the model like yeah. handle it? Yeah, way? yeah. Well, it's you know, it's interesting. A lot of, you know, this is where this this, this idea that biological measurements tend to show this bell-shaped curve. This is this is what uh, got Ketele so excited. Um, it's it can't. It, it doesn't follow that all differences in experimental effects will have that shape. Um, you can certainly look, you know, if you've got enough repeated measurements, you can just examine it. Um, if you think it's got a different shape, like a skewed shape, in conventional multi-level modeling programs don't make it easy to allow for that. But if you switch to a Bayesian estimation framework, you could you can be completely general about as long as it's a, as long as it's some distribution that you can name and it that in other words it's it has to be parametric I believe you can allow for all kinds of shapes, but it's it's not and maybe by transforming the measure you know like so taking the log of the reaction time. You know, that means what's normally distributed is the random effect of log of reaction time. If we looked at the distribution of the raw reaction times, it would not be normally distributed. So maybe through transformation you can, but that doesn't mean the phenomenon has that shape. But it's, it's, a, it's a good point. I do think we have the methods now to handle this. It's just you have to take a leap into a, a kind of relatively new way of doing analyses. Um, Liz, you've been, you're, you're still not quite, you've been thinking, I can, I can, you're thinking, so. Should I think aloud? No, think, think aloud, yeah. <laughs> There's nobody at the back trying to get in now. Well, so one thing is, I'm wondering how this relates to this paper that was in CMAS a couple years ago called Lack of Groups and Individual Generalizability is a Threat to Human Subjects Research, kind of arguing that like, and, and this is interesting to me because 
you know, from the happiness research that I do, people always want to draw like implications for their own lives. Yeah. Well, we're always just doing this at a between subject level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know this paper. Yeah. Aaron Fisher. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so is this sort of like <coughs> a further instantiation of this idea of like it is really risky to be saying like, oh, you know, if you want to do better at this competition task, do it with somebody else. Because for like a third of the people, you're genuinely making it worse for them. And that's fine if you just think of that as error. But if it's not error, then that's really disturbing. Yeah. And, and But I guess then like how do we really know that it's not error? Because I was thinking of like in my head this study of where you could have people like spend money on others for five days, spend money on themselves for five days, right? And maybe we see for some people they're better off on the days they spend money on others, and some people are actually better off on days where they spend money on themselves. But I would feel like there really is measurement error there, like where like people might have just gotten an also an A or might have been sunny sure. on the day they spent money on themselves. Oh, yeah. So that does seem like error. So I wouldn't, I, anyway. Yeah, I'm so, th so there's, there's all, you know, <laughs> this doesn't get rid of, I mean, I think these kind of, you know, these, you know, Showing stimuli on a computer screen, you know, makes this a more tractable thing and you can rule out more things. But as you get into, when you're trying to look at people in real life context, yeah, there's a lot of other things that could be going on. Um, I, those things could make it harder to find heterogeneity. I mean, they'll, they'll, if they're adding, if they're sort of coming in randomly, they'll, they'll just add noise. But, you know, there's other, you know, so some of the assumptions are that, you know, the, the manipulation is valid. Like, you know, it actually is doing what it's doing. And if that's not true, then all of this doesn't work. Um, but it's more, it's more just a way of thinking that, you know, if you have in your mind that, yes, I'm using a between subjects design, I have an effect that I'm pretty sure, you know, looks good. Um, well, I mean, you should just look at the variation within the treatment and the control groups and ask yourself, you know, I can't be sure, I can't know that if I had these people over here that they would react to the, you know, so the average person, I think it's just, it's, it's the problem. The, the reason I went back to show you some more history of this is that I, I do think it's very fundamental that we, you know, we want to talk about the one effect. Mm -hmm. And the data, you know, the, the people that we're studying, and this isn't just about people, it's about groups, it's about societies, it's about, mm -hmm. but it's also about cells. Um, we just shouldn't, we should just allow, for, you know, think that people might be different. It may not be that big, or it may be really big. And the only way to know is to have a design that allows you to estimate it. And I'll just say again, there's a, I don't know, there must be, you know, 50,000 repeated measures data sets out there somewhere that nobody has actually looked at in this way. I think it would be fun if there's a few of them lying around in this department. Why don't you just take a look and tell me what you find if, you, <laughs> if you're so inclined. I think right. that's it. Oh, did you have another question? No, I think that's okay, good. Well, good. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you.